a 90-year-old couple sat on the front porch one evening. The husband suddenly was overcome with the beauty of the moment, and feeling sentimental, he turned to his wife, who was very hard of hearing. He said to her, I'm proud of you. Huh? She said. I said, I am proud of you. What did you say? She asked again. He said a little louder, I am proud of you. Oh, she said, I'm tired of you too. (laughs) More often than not, the case is that over time, the more familiar we are with something, the less captivation we have with it. We tire of things very quickly, don't we? You know the saying, familiarity breeds contempt, but really it's familiarity just breeds indifference. What once fascinated us is the newness fades, we begin to lose the wonder of it. I mean, it can happen in our relationships It can happen living in in beautiful surroundings that we have right here in the Lakes region. It can happen with a newfound faith in Christ. It can happen in years of walking with the Lord. It most definitely can happen when it comes to the Christmas story. We have heard it over and over and over, and slowly the wonder of what occurred some 2,000 years ago diminishes. And so the old old story can become just that, the old, old story, and we tire of it. In the 90s movie, Joe vs. the Volcano, Patricia states, my father says almost the whole world's asleep. Everybody you know, everybody you see, everybody you talk to. He says only a few people are awake, and they live in a state of constant, total amazement. Whatever happened to wonder? When Jesus taught or answered his critics, scripture often says the people were amazed at what he said. Are we still amazed? Are we still stunned by his coming? Is there very little sizzle left in the, in the events surrounding the birth of Christ? Has the story been reduced to holiday cliché? I mean, we're bombarded with holiday symbols, the tree and the one-horse open sleigh and the inflatable Santa. That one always gets me. The ornaments, the nativity scenes, we're inundated with reminders of how we can be of good cheer and and the spirit of giving. There, 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 There are hundreds of movies on Hallmark or Lifetime. There's Miracle on 34th Street. It's it's a wonderful life shown over and over and over again. Now, this is not, you know, one writer expressed it this way: there's nothing necessarily wrong with any of these things. But, he goes on, but without a spark of wonder and awe to light the way, Christmas can become a predictable paint-by-numbers exercise, seemingly with nothing new to offer. It was G.K. Chesterton who said, the world's not lacking in wonders, but in a sense of wonder. The dictionary defines wonder as a feeling of surprise, mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, and inexplicable. Now, what was the wonder of the first Christmas? Well, well, the God who could order armies, move kings like pawns on a chessboard, create with a single word, the God who held the stars in place, emerged in Palestine as a baby who could not speak or eat solid food, and who depended on a couple of teenagers for food, shelter, protection, and love. Listen to how Philip Yancey put it. He said, the God who came to earth came not in a raging whirlwind, nor in a devouring fire. Imaginably, the maker of all things shrank down, 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 
so small as to become an ovum, a single fertilized egg, barely visible to the naked eye, an egg that would divide and redivide until a fetus took shape, enlarging cell by cell inside a nervous teenager. Do we hear that and go, God became man. Oh, that's neat. Let's move on. Back a few years ago, Don and I had the privilege of celebrating our 25th anniversary in Branson, Missouri. And one night, we were having dinner on the boardwalk at Branson Landing. And suddenly, to our surprise, there was this spectacular water attraction that features the first ever merging of water, fire, light, and music. I mean, it was phenomenal. Just outside from where we were seated, there was this dazzling interplay of water fountains shooting 120-foot geysers, fire cannons blasting, all choreographed to light and music. It was absolutely amazing. But more amazing than that was that not a single waiter or waitress or busboy or locals looked out Uh, looked out at the huge huge windows to see any of this. And when I mentioned to the waitress, making it then obvious I was a tourist, how amazing it was, her reply was brief and polite, but nothing more. The fountains, entirely too familiar, had lost its power to impress them. 2,000 years ago, there was a big event, the Christmas story. Has the familiar lost its power to impress you? Can we really simply go back to our jobs and and back to our homes and back to our neighborhoods and, and back to celebrating another Christmas, business as usual? Or will it change you and me? As Einstein put it, He who can no longer pause to wonder is as good as dead. So let's pause this Christmas season in hopes that we will lose ourselves in the wonder of Christmas. I've entitled this brief series, Whatever Happened to Wonder. I really could have spent much more than just a few weeks on this, but I didn't want you to tire of it. So I've chosen to look at the wonder of prophecy this morning, and then the wonder of genealogy Next Sunday, there is a wonder in that. And then, the, and then it will all culminate on Christmas Eve as we look at the wonder of it all. Well, I trust you have your Bibles with you. I hope you do. They're in front of you if you don't. And I'd invite you to turn and open it to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, the very first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. Now, I chose this passage because it's not one that we think of as relating to the Advent season, the Christmas story. But I want to look at Genesis chapter 3. Really, we're zooming in on just two verses, verses 14 and 15. And I want to unpack these two verses. And for outline purposes, I've set it up this way. The pronouncement of judgment, and then the prophecy of perpetual struggle, and then the promise of Christ's triumph. So the pronouncement of judgment the prophecy of perpetual struggle, and the promise of Christ's triumph. That's the outline for these two verses. And so let's dig in a little bit and look at the pronouncement of judgment. And before we look at these verses, I need to remind you of the context of Genesis chapter 3. As you likely know, Genesis chapter 1 and 2 describe the creation. It's worth noting that everything in chapter 1 and everything in chapter 2 in Genesis is good. When it's all said and done, it is good. It's in chapter 3 that everything goes bad. I mean, really bad, fatally bad, historically bad. Because there isn't a person in this room who isn't affected by what happened in Genesis chapter 3. There isn't a person in this world presently and who has ever walked on this earth, and who will walk on this earth, that aren't affected by what happened in Genesis chapter 3. I'm reminded of the mom who was talking with her five-year-old daughter about her wrong behavior. And, uh, and that because of her disobedience, she would have to live with consequences. 
Oh, mommy, she said with a terrified look on her face, please don't make me live with consequences. I want to live here with you. (laughs) She had no idea what consequences meant. We live with the consequences of what happened in Genesis chapter 3. It's Genesis chapter 3 that gives us the explanation as to why things in this world are the way they are. The evil, the brokenness, the terrorist acts, the beheadings, the school shootings, the earthquakes, the hatred, the disaster of all kinds, the bad and the ugly that we read about on the news all the time. It all comes from Genesis chapter 3. Now, I'm not going to get into all that happens in this chapter, but suffice it to say, prior to their bad decision, Adam and Eve lived in a state of innocence, free from sin, no sense of shame or guilt. They had harmony with each other. They had harmony with God. They had harmony with the world around them. They lived in a perfect world. And when you stop and think about it, you, you kind of have to feel a little bad for Adam and Eve. Just, just go with me for a second here. They had no one to blame. (laughs) They couldn't blame their environment they grew up in. (laughs) They couldn't blame bad education. They couldn't even blame their parents. Bummer. At the end of the day, they had no one to blame but themselves. And it is in chapter 3 that they became what? Doubters of God and his goodness, and they fell to the temptation of Satan. And you know what? That's really the root of all our sin. When we choose sin, we are doubting God's goodness. We really could boil it down to that. When we choose to sin, we are doubting God's goodness. We are saying that what we, what what God says about it can't be trusted and we know better. That's really what we're saying. Because of one sin, in Genesis 3, there was condemnation for all people. And because we all sin, we all stand condemned before God. By nature, we are opposed to God. So there's judgment, and really, that's what we deserve. But before God pronounces his judgment on Adam and Eve for their choosing to sin, he pronounces his judgment on the snake, which is what our attention is this morning in those two verses, verses 14 and 15. And you have to ask, why the snake? Well, it was the snake, you recall, that got into this conversation with Eve. Now again, I kind of, my mind just kind of goes here, and I go, why in the world was she talking to a snake that talked in the first place is beyond me. That, I mean, that didn't raise any flags. For some reason it didn't. That's a question on my mind. I mean, perhaps he was some cuddly thing before this curse was, was pronounced on him. We don't know. I, I, I honestly, again, I can't help but think of the Geico Gecko Lizard Stands on his two hind feet to just kind of talk. That's just me. But whatever this creature was prior to this curse, we don't really know. Whatever might have been attractive about the snake changed from this point on. And verse 14 informs us. Look what verse 14 says. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. Now, Now watch this closely, what he says next. You will eventually grow legs, start walking, climb up trees, grow feathers, and become birds. It's not what it says. That's what the evolutionists might want us to believe. Not true. It says that they will what? Crawl on their bellies, and they will eat dust all the days of their lives. The curse is permanent. Even in the millennial kingdom, while the wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion and the ox, it says, will eat straw together. Do you know what snakes will be doing, even the millennial period? Isaiah 65, verse 25 says, dust will be the serpent's food. As they slither and move about on the ground, on their bellies, they will lick dust. Now, some scholars suggest that licking dust was an Old Testament expression of total defeat. So you can kind of do that on your own and check it out, and that can be your homework. Psalm 72, 9 and Isaiah 49, 23 speak of that. Now, now snakes don't feel the curse, really. They just illustrate it. 
It's the one behind the snake that is of greater interest. And so we're going to see here in a moment, snakes are a permanent symbol and constant reminder of the humiliation defeat of Satan. It extends beyond the animal kingdom. It is a curse on Satan. The serpent of old is Satan, it says in the book of Revelation. Now notice that verse 15 begins with the words, I will. I will. These are prevalent and significant words throughout the rest of Scripture. God says later to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. Jesus says to his disciples, I will make you fishers of men. Jesus says to all his followers, I will be with you to the very end of the age. Jesus says to all ages, I will build my church. I will. Check out the many I wills in Scripture. I mean, in your own study of Scripture, when you come to an I will, circle that, mark it down, note that when God says I will, he will. And when God says I will, our response should be what? Believe God. We should take God at his word. And so the phrase I will speaks of divine initiative, divine action, divine sovereignty. God's still in charge and calling the shots. And so God says here, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, what do we have going on here? We have two things going on here. We have the prophecy of perpetual struggle and the promise of Christ's triumph, which make up our other two points in this outline. The prophecy of perpetual struggle and the promise of Christ's triumph. So so let's look at the prophecy of perpetual struggle. The prophecy of Genesis 3.15 is addressed to the serpent, not mankind. It's part of the judgment passed on on who is the enemy of both God and man. We find here also a warning of conflict, great conflict, and perpetual struggle of satanic powers which will oppose mankind and God's plan of salvation through the one who would come, Jesus Christ. And so verse 15, God says, I will put enmity between you, the snake, and the woman, and between your offspring, or seed, the snake, and hers. Now, the word enmity means deep animosity between morally responsible human beings. In other words, the battle lines are drawn. There's going to be constant hostility between Satan and the woman. Why will there be war, this perpetual struggle, we must ask? I mean, didn't Eve choose to go along with Satan through the temptation of the snake? Wouldn't we say she was kind of on Satan's side here and, and against God? Why would there be an ongoing battle between Eve and the serpents? Well, it suggests that Eve's affections turn toward God. In response to their rebellion, the gracious, sovereign Lord intervenes by changing Eve's affections so that she will love God, submit to his rule, and as a result of that, be at enmity with Satan. Adam and Eve chose to doubt God, but Satan has not won. He will not exercise complete control. There will be those who oppose Satan and submit to God, those who hate Satan and love God. That's the struggle here. Well, how will this happen? It happens only one way. The only way that a human heart will love and submit to God is to have some profound change within. There has to be some kind of radical transformation, some deep, deep change of the human heart to turn women and men back to God. Other prophets spoke of this as as having a new heart. Jesus spoke of this as the new birth. The old Adam has to die, a new Adam has to be born. The old Eve has to die, and the new Eve has to be born. New men, new women, who hate Satan and love God. And God says here by this prophecy, that change will come. And so when it speaks of enmity here between the serpent and Eve, it really moves from the individual to the plural. It speaks of the serpent's offspring or seed and Eve's offspring or seed. Now, obviously, offspring here is speaking in a spiritual rather than physical sense. It's referring to two. We have two groups of people in this world. There's not a third. There's two groups of people. 
There's followers of God and there's followers of Satan. There's believers and there's unbelievers. Whose seed are you? So there would be this constant combat between the godly seed and the ungodly seed. And it isn't that far in the Old Testament that history that this plays out between Cain and Abel. Now, the, the, the one wonder of this prophecy, on the one hand, is that God would need this remnant, a godly line of believers who would become the channel for the seed of the woman. The wonder of this promise is that God protects the seed in spite of continued opposition by the serpents. Now, unless I miss my guess, I think Satan understood this prophecy. Because what is Satan's strategy from this point forward? He tries to destroy the line of Messiah. We see it over and over again in the Old Testament as he sets out to annihilate the Jews. We see his opposition to kingdom work here. If we're on the side of Christ, it really shouldn't surprise us then that there's going to be this constant battle that's going on in our lives. It's a battle we all know too well, don't we? We experience that perpetual struggle. Prophesied it right here. Now there's hope. There's hope. It leads us to our third point, the promise of Christ's triumph. The promise of Christ's triumph. In Genesis 3.15, we find the sign of the promised seed. Her seed would crush the serpent's head. Now it's right here. It's right here that the Christmas story becomes relevant. This is the only place in the Bible, as far as I know, where it speaks of a seed of a woman. It's more common to talk about the seed of men. So this reference to a seed of the woman is predicting that there is one who would be born without man's seed, without a human father, and that, and that, that is the virgin-born Christ, the Son of God. That's what it's predicting. This line of prophetic truth regarding the birth of the seed of the woman becomes more and more amazing and wonderful as we're able to pinpoint accurately just who this deliverer is, when and where and how he would be born, and the other amazing details predicted by the Old Testament scriptures hundreds of years in advance. Mark mentioned that earlier in worship as we were singing, and he mentioned with that passage of scripture, there's hundreds of verses that speak of this coming Christ. Jesus Christ is the promised seed. He is the one in whom the nations would be blessed. He is the answer to man's greatest needs. Now, don't lose the wonder of this. In this one verse, we are told where God is going in the rest of the Bible. Wow. We can't just go, oh, that's neat. This is an incredible prophecy because we see here the promise of a Savior. Yes, in Genesis 3. Yes, in a pronouncement of judgment. Yes, we see the promise of a Savior in a response to the fall of mankind. Yes, in the midst of consequences of their doubting and disobeying God, we see here a promise of a Savior. Right when Satan might have thought by what he did in the Garden of Eden of one, God says, not so fast. Just when Satan figured he won the hearts of the whole human race. God states that Eve will turn on him and out of her seed will come a redeemed humanity and a redeemer. The first flicker of the gospel is found in the curse on Satan. Wow. Isn't that remarkable? We have embedded in the curse itself, the gospel, the good news. We see the character of God on perfect display who is by nature a savior and redeemer. We see the one who is gracious and merciful, marked by loving kindness. Where do we see that here? Well, specifically in the final words of this pronouncement of judgment. Notice again the end of verse 15. The language here moves from using the plural form of seed or offspring to speaking of a singular seed or offspring of Eve. God says, the end of verse 15, he, meaning an offspring of Eve, will crush your serpent's head and you, serpent, will strike his heel. 
Now, I think there's a little trash talking going on here. <laughs> God's saying to Satan, there will be one individual who will come from the seed of a woman who will be your destroyer. For God says, you will bruise his heel. He's going to crush your head. Oh, Satan will have his day of bruising the Messiah, but it will not be a mortal wound. But in contrast, the blow to Satan will be fatal. Well, how is Satan dealt a fatal blow? At the cross. By satisfying the justice and holiness of God, by paying the debt to, of, to God for our sin, by, by defeating death and rising from the dead. Here's the wonder of it. We aren't very far in the scriptures, Genesis chapter 3, and we come to the cross. Satan will be trampled. Christ will triumph. And it's on the cross that Christ crushed Satan's head. And now he is writhing around. He's doing all that he can in this world to cause harm, but he was beaten on the cross. Now, James Dobson tells uh, the story of a missionary in Africa who returned to his hut late one afternoon. As he entered the front door of his house, his home, he was confronted by a huge python on his floor. He ran back to his truck. He retrieved his 45 caliber pistol, but unfortunately, he had only one bullet in the chamber. No extra ammunition. Taking careful aim, the, the, the missionary sent that single shot into the head of the reptile, and then he himself retreated to the front yard. The snake was mortally wounded, but it did not die quickly. It began frantically thrashing and writhing on the floor. From the front yard where the missionary was standing, he could hear furniture inside his home breaking and lamps crashing, and he knew it was just a mess in there. When all was quiet, the man cautiously re-entered his house, and he found that the snake was indeed dead, but the entire interior of his house was shattered. In its dying moments, get this, in its dying moments, the python had unleashed all its mighty power and wrath on everything in sight. In the same way, the serpent's days are numbered, and he knows it. But Satan will continue to unleash all his fury because the enemy of our souls will do all that he can to shake our faith. He'll do all that he can to wreak havoc in our lives. He'll do all that he can to try to gain a foothold on our marriages, gain a foothold on our homes, and in our churches, and our youth groups, and our small groups, and our Christian friendships, and our leadership. He'll do all that he can. He's still thrashing about. And while we mustn't find Satan under every rock, neither should we minimize his intentions, nor be naive to his plots. Now, here's the good news. God is for us against our adversary. God has won the victory. Satan has been trampled. Christ will triumph. That is what Genesis 3, 14, and 15 tell us. This prediction back in Genesis 3, 15 of a coming Messiah came true at the moment of Virgin Mary's conception and subsequent birth that first Christmas gets even better. If you're still with me, and I hope you are, turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to put the verses up on the screen because I don't want us to miss this. The application's right here. Land in the plane. We're connecting the dots. However you want to look at it, here it is. This is incredibly fascinating. And in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, the context is speaking of the promises of God. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, but as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. Here's the punchline, verse 20. 
But no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Here's the flow of thought. If Old Testament predictions of Christ come true, then God has told the truth. And if Christ has come, God is true. And if God is true, then all of his promises will come true. And if you're in Christ by faith, you will inherit all the promises of God that were meant for you. All of God's promises are based upon and find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. This promise that goes back as far as Genesis 3 is a what? It is a yes in Christ. That means all other promises are also a yes in Christ. Here's the wonder of Christmas. Christmas is God's great confirmation of all his promises. Christmas is God's great confirmation of all its promises. Or to put it simply, Christmas is God's yes. Now, I couldn't help myself. It's fourth quarter. (laughs) There's five seconds left on the clock. Patriots are down by four points. I told you I couldn't help myself. Tom Brady goes back to throw. There's pressure on him. He's at the 20-yard line. He, He moves up to the line of scrimmage, and he sees some daylight. Might he run for it? Not a chance. He spots his receiver, Gronkowski. He's healthy now. He's back playing. He spots him in the end zone, and he delivers a nice pass in his direction. Gronkowski and the defender both go up for the catch, and the the defender catches the ball. He's intercepted the pass. But wait. The ball bounces off the defender's chest, and lands into the arms of Kronkowski. He makes the catch just over the goal line for a touchdown. Yes! Right? Yes! That hole in one. Yes! That A on the exam. Yes! The day of getting your license. Yes! Not for your parents. Good news of pregnancy, yes! That beautiful sunset, God will never leave us nor forsake us. God's sufficient grace, God will provide, God will reward faithfulness. Jesus will finish the work he has begun, yes! Yes! Yes. Christmas is God's great confirmation of all his promises. They are yes! In Christ. That's what saying amen is all about. Really. When we say amen, so be it. We're saying yes. What God says he will do. He will do. That's what I want us to grasp. This morning. Because Christmas is God's great confirmation. Of all his promises. Linda Holm, one-time member of the band Dallas Holm in Praise, found a malignant lump in her breast. Though her faith was strong and she was sure of God's providence, she crumbled emotionally when she heard the news. She underwent a mastectomy and six months of chemotherapy. Her husband, musician Dallas Holm, later said in an interview, He said, sometimes in our valley and in our sorrow, we believe if we just knew what God was doing, that would settle it. I'm not sure that would make any difference, he says. Faith is when you don't know, when it doesn't make sense, when you can't understand it, but but you trust in God. Christmas is God's confirmation of all his promises, what he says he will do, he will do, not sometimes, every time. God is a promise keeper. Let's be a promise believer. How's your faith? And the God who plans your future. Can you trust him? He'll never fail you in whatever you face this coming week or the weeks to come. Never. Yes. Let's pray. God, 
Help us to not lose the wonder of this season because if this didn't happen, we really can't say yes. There's nothing to say yes and get excited about. The fact is, it did happen. Christ was born, our Redeemer, Savior of the world. God help us to be a promised believer, not only in that single event, but to know that if you who have given us your Son, you will also graciously give us all things. God, help us to believe that. We respond to you by giving to you, by anticipating your coming again, and bringing all your rewards with you, because not one good deed has escaped your notice. And you are just. Thank you. All that you've done and you are doing in our lives. To that we say, Amen. Yes.